Okay, so we're looking at the resurrection principle. It's the title I usually use for Easter. Always slightly different. The idea of uh, resurrection, of course, we turn back 2,000 years to the historical side of it, to the crucifixion, resurrection, the biblical account of these things. But we are also in the habit of looking at the meaning behind these things, the metaphysical meaning or spiritual meaning. Uh, to see what principles are there that uh, we can apply to our daily life. And it's, uh, there are plenty there. And this resurrection principle is one that is probably one of the most important that we can think of because as we live our lives from day to day, we are always under the pressure of conforming to appearances of conforming to the world and by that we are uh, living a fairly reactionary state and it's uh, very difficult not to do this because we're so ingrained in doing it but the resurrection principle actually applies to our remembering that we are not subject to whatever it is we're reacting to that this is a level of perception that we're looking at and uh, that there are other ways to experience the thing that we're going through. And so we want to remind ourselves of those. And I just love this idea that I am in an eternal soul and I'm temporarily inhabiting this body. Uh, I remind myself of this almost daily because I'm in the habit of uh, listening to near-death people that have had that experience and uh, I usually listen to one or two of those reports a day and they all say the same thing you know the the bottom line is that we're not this body this is not who we are and some people get into the idea of well what were we have we reincarnated have we been here before that doesn't really matter to me and it may to some of you and it may uh, it's a fascinating subject but um I don't have to be convinced that I'm more than this body. I have to be reminded sometimes that I am more this, than this body because usually when I'm having a negative reaction it's because I'm thinking I'm just this body and something's after me, you know, and I, <laughs> I've got to protect myself. I've got to uh, watch what happens. And so my defenses come up and, uh, you know, that, that's a natural thing. It's, you'll see it in all of nature. It's uh, the fight or flight uh, reaction I think we all have. But that's all tied to the body. You know, what if somebody threw a knife at you and it went right through you and didn't even bother you? <laughs> that's you. That's your soul. Uh, the soul cannot be killed. The soul cannot be threatened in any way. And all of our negative reactions in life are tied to the body. And we don't want to ignore that. We're not going to ignore that because that would be pretty impractical too. It's, uh, there's a lot of things that can go wrong with the body and just some very unexpected things. I was reaching in my briefcase a couple of days ago and slid my, fing my guitar finger against a piece of paper. And a paper cut is one of the most painful cuts. <laughs> And I don't know what that just that goes against all physics. It goes against everything that we've all, all learned. But I thought I put my hand in a bear trap, you know, and <laughs> it's it just my briefcase. And I told everybody here about it, and they all had all the recommendations for super glue. And I just didn't want my hand to be stuck to my guitar, you know. I, I don't know. <laughs> but I have not tried that yet, but I will sometime. But. Uh, Anyway, the body's subject to these things all the time, and so you get a paper cut and you have all these thoughts. <laughs> Ouch, you know, that hurts. Um, there's something that, there's no way your soul could get a paper cut. You know, it just wouldn't happen, never would happen. But we're in this body, so we want to pay attention to it. We want to acknowledge it. We're not going to deny it. And I think that's, there's a spir spiritual discipline that does that. It denies the body, it denies the earthly experience. It, does everything it can to push it away and to rise above it. And I think as Jesus prayed for his disciples, he didn't pray that they be, that they be removed from the world, but they be uh, kept from the evil one. And what is the evil one? 
it's that one that reacts over the paper cut, you know, and over the, the threat to your uh, physical well-being. It's that part of uh, our thinking that uh, thinks we're just human, and it, uh, you know, paints itself in many corners, many ways. And so that's what we're looking at, how to resurrect, how to bring out this fourth dimension, this higher self in our daily experiences. One of the ways we get caught up in it is through religion, I think. Uh, it's common today to hear people say they're pursuing a spiritual rather than a religious path. How many of you would consider yourself one of those? Yeah. And it's not that there's anything against religion, but when you think about what religion is asking us to, to believe about ourselves, uh, the possibility that I could go to hell, for example, um, just that alone is a pretty big deal, you know, that can keep you living in fear all of your life. And I've seen that happen with people. And I've seen it happen uh, in ways that are just not healthy, where a person actually fears that so much part of their life, they fear it for so long that, you know, I think I've shared with you, I, I was in uh, at a hospital, making a hospital visit of a woman who thought she could go to hell. She was dying. And she was having a miserable death. You know, death's bad enough, let alone a miserable one. You know, it's like, <laughs> we don't want a miserable death. But, I mean, she was terrified that she was going to hell. And where does that come from? Uh, people on the spiritual path don't generally take that piece of baggage with them. It's a religious thing. And it is a very strong controlling factor in that, in that field. And so we as individuals have to reach a point where we're going to say, am I going to continue to buy into that or am I going to think of it differently? And I think most of us here have made that decision and we're probably still carrying stragglers, you know, straggles, uh, straggling thoughts about it with us. But um, I don't think that's the reality. I think that when we all leave this body, when we leave, leave this plane, that it is a, going to be an indescribably beautiful experience for every one of us. And I don't care how bad or evil you are, not that any of you are, but um, you may think you are. You may think you don't deserve, but that's what this woman in the hospital, you know, she didn't deserve. Something in her past, uh, she bought into this hell thing, and that's where she was possibly going, just the thought. And it wouldn't, didn't matter what I said to her, you know, I did my best to not try to change her mind, but just say, well, maybe it's not that way. You know, maybe you're uh, bought into this for n no reason. But that's kind of the product of religion that thinking would not naturally arise in a person who would just spend their life meditating, for example, not going to church, but just opening themselves to what is this soul? What is this God thing? You know, asking directly, not asking a professional uh, religious person, but going within and asking spirit within. Um, that's what uh, Zechariah, I think it was, and I think Jesus modeled his uh, whole ministry after this prophecy of Je uh, Zechariah who said that the law would be written on our hearts and souls that it uh, you know it's within each person that we will no longer ask another person to teach us because it's all within us and that's uh, I, I should have had that here to quote because it's a beautiful I might talk about that next week actually it's a beautiful scripture and I think Jesus used that as his ministry, the model for his ministry, the model for his theology, that uh, he saw the law written on our hearts. So if the law is written on our hearts, where would we go to learn the law? We would go within. You know, we would turn our attention within. So it's common today to hear people say they are pursuing a spiritual rather than a religious path. For many, dogmatic religion is too restrictive in its scope. The spiritual perspective allows us to lay aside the preconceived doctrine of the organized church and take a more intuitive and natural approach. And some people are afraid to do this. 
they're afraid of uh, straying outside the flock and uh, becoming one of the lost sheep. And that's, you know, nobody would force anybody to do that. The only thing that will force you to do it is your own questioning, your own inner guidance. And that's what I have observed in my 40 some years of ministry is people will buy into something they have been taught until they reach the end of the rope. It no longer answers the crisis that they're involved in, no longer answers the problem that they're having. So they start saying, this doesn't answer my questions. So what now? You know, what is the answer? Is there an answer? And they start a quest that's more of a spiritual journey than a religious one. And it's a, often a very long uh, transforming process or trans, uh, transitioning process. But um, if you have been raised in traditional religion as I was, and most of my life has not been in traditional religion, but that made such an impression that I still carry it. I still carry a lot of it. It doesn't guide my life. It doesn't guide my thinking like it used to. But it's still there. It's like remnants pop up all the time. And it's, uh, it's not a bad thing necessarily. It's just that I, now I, I see when it's happening. I see, is this the old training? And what I'm doing with my, this book I'm working on, and I, don't, I may never get it done, I don't know, because it just keeps unfolding like the peeling an onion, you know. <laughs> There's layer after layer after layer. And I, I will seek to answer a question. But what I find as I'm doing this is I am challenging the beliefs that I have been brought up with. And that is a, it's a very therapeutic thing to do, but it's also kind of scary. You know, because I know what the, the kind of community I came out of that I was raised in. I know how they would think about what I just wrote. They would call me a heretic. You know, they would call me a, a, an atheist or something like that, but I'm not. I feel like I'm more deeply spiritual than I ever was when I was trying to practice a formal religion. Uh, and even when I was doing that, I was never sure that I was saved. Uh, the Baptist church, I think it was, that, that I would attend would have the altar call every Sunday. And we would sing, just as I am, uh, you know, this thing. And it's, many of the same people would go up every Sunday. And I would think to myself, you know, and, and the minister would be up there giving this monologue about Jesus speaking to your heart and all this and you know it, it can be a very meaningful thing I'm not putting that down but I was thinking I wonder if I'm really saved <laughs> and I asked him do you think I ought to come up you know because I'm feeling these as you're speaking I'm feeling these uh, feelings I'm you know I'm a teenager uh, going through this and teenagers are not exactly free of sin you know <laughs> <is> this, <laughs> At least the ones I hung out with <laughs> weren't. And so I thought the chances were about 50-50, you know, that I could <laughs> go up or down. But um, St. Peter would give me the thumbs down, you know, that would be a pretty good chance. He said, no, you're all right. You've been saved. And I was immersed. How many of you have been immersed? A lot of you. Do you feel any more confident than any? <laughs> than those who've, how many have been sprinkled? Okay, uh, pretty interesting. So I wonder if the, if the immersed have more confidence in the sprinkle. I, that we'll have to do a, we'll have to do a, yeah, we'll have to do a poll on that. <clears throat> a scientific study of some kind. It seems like if you're fully immersed, you ought to be better protected. You know, that's, <laughs> I took a really deep breath, you know, and I didn't know if that minister was going to let me up or not, but he, he decided to, uh, probably because he knew he would have a tither, you know, coming up and didn't want to hurt the income base. Anyway, let's go to the next thing here. So Jesus challenged many enshrined rules of Judaism while highlighting the spiritual truth behind the teaching. 
If he were alive today, I believe he would again call attention to the spiritual truth behind the resurrection story of Easter that we hear every year. And I quoted this last week, and I think it is uh, very appropriate. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So are we talking about his crucifixion, or are we talking about ours? Are we talking about us dying to something, falling into the ground, dying to a self-perception, so that we can be... Uh, begin to to bear fruit and what is how do we bear fruit what is the fruit that we bear it's things like peace of mind it's things like broad vision it's things like fearlessness you know it, it comes in a lot of forms and we go through many negative renditions of uh, you know ramifications of uh, sin and all that stuff uh, we can go through a lot of things in a single day, in a single hour, in a single conversation that we have with somebody. We can go to some very low levels that have nothing to do with the state of the soul. And so it's very easy to slip off into a self-perception that we've always carried, but it doesn't apply to our spiritual nature. So we've got to constantly be on the alert, constantly be watching you know, what's going on in our thoughts and feelings. Jesus spoke of the need to be born again, to replace old wineskins with new, to sell our current belief system and purchase a field containing treasure, to become as trusting as a child who's not yet loaded down with spiritual preconceptions. He challenged many of the Jewish beliefs, uh, many around things like washing your hands before you eat or what you eat, uh, there's all kinds of rules. Healing on the Sabbath, uh, that was supposed to be considered work, uh, not something you're not supposed to do. And he would do these things because I think he saw the, the silliness. As I have pointed out, the Jew that lived in Jerusalem had over 600 rules they had to uphold every day. Uh, if they were related to... Uh, many of these were related to the temple so if you did not live in Jerusalem you didn't have to you only had 599 I think <laughs> but it's and I'm not making light of that either because it, that's a very important aspect in Ju to Judaism I don't adopt it I'm not a Jew so I, I have no trouble challenging that questioning that that it's not how you act it's so Jesus says it's not what goes into your mouth that causes the problem it's what comes out that makes perfect sense to all of us, doesn't it? It's like a lot of things go in our mouths, but that doesn't really make us good or bad people. But it would if that is one of the restrictions that's put on you by religion. If you eat something that's an unclean whatever, you know, you, you sin and you've got a problem. You've broken the law. But most of us, we would break the law just by saying, I want to stay on a good diet, I want to eat healthy, and all of that. And uh, it's a personal decision that we make. It's not a religious thing. So to think that if I eat a certain food that God would be offended by that, you know, think about that. I would think about that. And Jesus thought about it, apparently, because he said it's not what goes in your mouth, it's what comes out. And he also said if, if you had an ox that waded into the mud on the Sabbath, would you just leave it there? Would you get it out? If you had a son that was, uh, you know, hurt or fell into a pit, I think he said, would you not get him out on the Sabbath? And the, the rulers didn't know how to answer that. He's just saying religion can be very restrictive, and we've all found that in some ways. So, if there was no religion at all, there's still God. There's still us. There's still a relationship between us and God. And so that's the spiritual path. We figure that out. That's the questions, the kind of questions that we ask. And I feel much lighter not worrying about what the religion says than I do about how I feel uh, and what is true in my own perception. What is true in my understanding of my relationship to God, because I believe I and the Father are one, 
And sometimes I feel separated from my father, my source, my spiritual source. So I would ask the question, why? Why would I feel that way? What, what am I doing to cause me to feel separate from God? That would be the sin, and it's sin in the sense of the archery term S-Y-N, falling short, missing the mark. When we put it in perspectives like this, it takes all the guilt away. So I'm feeling like I'm separate from God. What am I doing to bring that about? And everything's fixable. You know, that's the good news. And as I am saying more and more all the time, you can totally mess this life up. You'll still be okay. I'm absolutely convinced of that. We worry about walking the straight and narrow. But I'm totally convinced from the probably thousands of stories I've heard people say, when you step into the light, when you step out of this body, all that's gone. All your sins are gone. All your problems are gone. You know, there are people that do claim they have a negative hellish experience. But that is, um, you're probably familiar with Eben Alexander's uh, neurosurgeon's uh, near-death story where his near-death experience started out, he said, in an earthworm horrible level of life, where he, he calls it the earthworm level because it felt like he was just in mud and he couldn't see, he couldn't, uh, you know, nothing. And had his near-death, had he been revived during that time, he would have come back saying, I had a negative near-death experience. But well, it progressed. He went on and he figured out how to rise out of that state. Uh, go online, Eben Alexander, he's, uh, he's got many uh, talks that he gives and I highly recommend him. He's a pretty energetic person, but he had an incredibly beautiful experience after that. And so a lot of researchers think if a person has a negative experience, it's not because they went to hell, it's because that's part of their consciousness that's being regurgitated and they haven't, didn't spend enough time being dead uh, for that all to be processed. And so they're, uh, they come back and they say, it's, I had a bad experience. And that's probably true. But it's, um, and I'm not promoting that. I'm just saying I, myself, by listening to these people, am absolutely convinced no matter what you do in your life, you'll be okay. You know, you're gonna come out just fine. And the experience that you, nobody wants to come back to this experience. That's the interesting thing. It is so beautiful, so incredible, they do not want to come back. And that, again, doesn't say that this is bad. It says, this is interesting. Why did we come here? In one way, by incarnating, by taking on a body, it's sort of like putting blinders on and plugging your ears up and saying, go out and be happy. You know, do your best to live a full life. By taking on a body, we lose, it looks like, about 99.9% .9 of our abilities. The soul has unlimited ability. Our vision, to start with, you know, it's pretty much straightforward. The soul is 360 degrees. You don't talk, you telepathically communicate. So you're never misunderstood. You never have a negative thought because you don't have a body. There's nothing to be negative about. There's no pain to have, no limitation of any kind. So <clears throat> we left that, and we left it for a reason. And I don't know what the reason is, but all of us are to take that perspective, start with the idea that I am more than this body, and whatever I'm going through, I chose to do it. And it's not that I consciously chose to have this real bad experience. I chose to be in a container that would enable that to happen. Because you can't hit the thumb of a soul's, the, the soul's thumb with a hammer, <laughs> however that is. You can't hurt yourself as a soul, but you can as a, with a body. You can get paper cuts and all kinds of weird things. But that doesn't make this a bad experience. We chose it for some reason. I, I have to think that. 
that I'm here because I want to be here. I don't always want to be here. Sometimes I don't want to be here. <laughs> There's many times I don't want to be here. And what I'm saying, I don't want to be here, it's like I don't want to be here. You know, the way I'm experiencing this earth at this moment. Because there's other times I love the earth. I love the experience I'm having. But I don't like this one. So we have to be careful about that. It's like, because there are people that say everything that happens to you, it's a choice. You know, it's a decision. It's a, it's a result of a choice you've made some way. And it may be. But that doesn't make you a bad person. And it doesn't mean that's going to be the permanent way things are. So this resurrection idea is remembering stuff like this. So here I am in this not so wonderful experience, but is, has something happened to me? Have I become something less? And the answer is no, I have not. I'm still the unlimited soul that I have always been. So all, all of this points to the need for a revamped, revitalized understanding of our spiritual nature. To be born again is the process of releasing our limited seed self. That part of our thinking that so identifies with the body that we lose sight of the truth, that we are spiritual rather than physical beings. Sometimes you may need to remove yourself from a situation, just go away, you know, get away from it. So you can re regain this understanding, this feeling that I am more than this suffering soul, this suffering person. Uh, sometimes you can't do that. Sometimes you have to do it while you're in the situation. But, and, and it's not easy to remember when you're angry, for example, that there is a person who is incapable of being angry in you, that that's what you are in truth. But while you're experiencing anger, while you're expressing at that level, uh, you don't want to get out of that for whatever reason, you're, you're kind of stuck there. Okay, so that's a sin. Is it a black mark against your soul? Absolutely not. It's just part of your consciousness, part of where you are right now in your daily thinking. And so part of the resurrection principle is to s make that separation. Okay, so I went off on this tangent. I was not the person I know I can be. Is that a black mark against my soul? No, it's not. The soul is unchanged. It's sort of like, uh, you know, the clouds come over, but there's still sun. It's still there. It's always there. It's unchanged. If you've ever had the experience of getting into an airplane on a cloudy day and flying up over the clouds, there's nothing quite like that. You know, if you've been under the clouds for a couple of days, that's kind of unusual for us here in Colorado. When it happens, we all whine about it because we're so used to <laughs> so much sunshine. But when you do that, you break up, break through those clouds. There's just nothing quite like that, like that vision that you that you have from that perspective. And so, if you think of that as you're you're capable of doing that within yourself, you know that there's a place in you that is never covered by clouds. Uh, the part that's covered by clouds, that's where we live daily. That's our daily thinking. And we mistake that for who we are. And it's not who we are. So can we remember to resurrect? Can we fly up into the sunshine, you know, get above the clouds and see that wonderful, what, what is a gray blockage when you're below the clouds becomes a beautifully golden carpet. You know, when you're up there, it just uh, there's times you can see forever, it looks like. And, um, you know, I, I can understand why they would equate something like that with heaven. Uh, with all these clouds and all this beautiful stuff. I wouldn't want to step out of the airplane, of course. But, and I've never seen anybody playing a harp up there. But um, it's, it's, a, it's a heavenly experience, especially when you've been under the clouds and then you go through them. So it is possible to have that kind of experience just in your emotional level, at, at your emotional and mental level, that you can be in this cloudy place and then you can suddenly release that and say, I'm more, there's more to me than this. 
and you can rise above it. If you're engaged in an argument with somebody, you may not be able to pull out of it at that moment. That's where I said step back if you have to, to regain that altitude and uh, see from the higher perspective. But the whole point of this is you are a soul. You're not that thing that's going through that problem. That's not you. That's uh, your current altitude. That's where you are at that particular moment. And it's, uh, but it's not you, and it's not damaging. It's only damaging to your now experience. You want to have a good experience, you're not having it right now. But you can. It's just that probably won't until you take time to let it go. And that's kind of our human training. Why do we react negatively to certain situations? We think something of value is being threatened in some way. And when you find that part of yourself, the soul, that cannot be threatened, and you relate more to that than you do the ego, then it's easier to do it. It's not easy, it's just easier. But the uh, resurrection principle is to remember that, that that's what I am. I am that part that is uh, undamageable and non-reactionary. There's a part of me that is at that level all the time. From a metaphysical perspective, the crucifixion represents the death of the mortal and the resurrection of the immortal. The immortal soul has always been with us, but becomes lost in our personal human quagmire. And that's the challenge of living with a body living with other bodies, li living with people. It's just uh, part of the thing, and it's so easy to think that's the reality. The body side of it is the reality, because that's, you know, we open our eyes and we hear and we go through life. That's, that is the most immediate reality. It's as we become still, you know, we separate ourselves, we go off. That's why Jesus, I think, would go off often and pray, uh, he'd go alone, to recapture that sense of who he was. And I think that's uh, probably what he taught others to do, is if you want to really become grounded in the soul, you've got to commune with it. You've got to go off and commune with it. And, you know, we live in a busy society. We have uh, cell phones. We have all kinds of ways to be distracted all the time. I was watching a kid walking down the street yesterday with the cell phone on one hand and earphones you know all the senses are engaged except in reality you know that's the interesting thing and I'm not criticizing because I could be that kid too uh, I have cell phones and I have uh, uh, I'm on YouTube a lot in fact I'd rather be on YouTube than in real life because <laughs> you can change channels <clears throat> no it's uh that's, that's going to be a challenge for this generation. It's a very addictive thing, you know, and uh, I love my cell phone. I love my computer. I would not attempt to write a book on a typewriter. I just, to me, that would be like, that would be hell. You know, that there would be, <laughs> there would be hell. You're gonna write this book on this typewriter. <clears throat> no, there was a time I, I would have done that. We all would have, and we all did. You know, we did many things. But when these things come about, they're so much better than the old that we don't want to give them up. And I'm a horrible speller, but my computer makes me look pretty smart. You know, it's just <laughs> a wonderful invention. So, okay, I don't know what that is. Okay. So how do we consciously resurrect the soul so that it may become the guiding feature of our daily thinking? First and foremost, we begin with the understanding that the soul, as forgotten as it may be, is still fully intact and unscathed even by our most negative thinking or thoughtless acts of unkindness. This is what people discover in their life reviews. Uh, they'll have a review of all the unkind things they did and how they made people feel. And they will feel the feelings that people had. And it sounds like a terrible thing to have to go through. But what they all say is, whoever is showing them these movies, you know, these these uh, this life review, they themselves are totally non-judgmental, 
and even kind of chuckle, you know, often at some of the things that uh, the stupid things people do. And we've all done them. We've all made people angry. We've hurt people. Uh, we've said good things to people. You know, they say all these things come up, both sides of it all. But the bottom line is the one that does the judging is the one that's whose life is being reviewed. And you know, if if and I actually review my life all the time. I remember things I have done said to people that uh, we're not too good. And so I go back in my thinking, I don't want to stand before Gabriel or whoever's doing the, running the movie uh, and have to explain anything to him. I would rather work it out myself, you know. And uh, so I try to do that. But what they say is they remember things come up they forgot about totally. So I'm sure that would happen to all of us. But we can do life reviews. And there are actually exercises where you you make that part of your your spiritual journey is to bring up all the negativity that you remember all the things you feel like you've done wrong and get to the point where you are you're okay with that that's your human self and you may have had the worst possible intentions but you're here now you know that's that's something that happened in the past and you can let it go and the soul itself is not condemned or broken by that very important step to take, I think. Our spiritual journey is not about developing or improving the soul, but recovering our awareness of it. And that's where I have kind of split off from a lot of my colleagues. It's uh, we're not we're not developing anything. We're remembering. We're recovering. And uh, that to me is a much better approach. I don't have to fix anything. I have to remember who I am and recover that consciously. That's, that's my work. Um, because if I keep myself on the evolutionary path, I'll never, I'll never get any place, never achieve it, never did. Our desire to do this indicates that we're already picking up on our soul's natural radiance. Before they call, I will answer is the soul's position. We affirm as Meister Eckhart did, that that which uh, we are looking for is that which is doing the looking. I've always liked that. It's a interesting thing because that is absolutely true. Why do we desire more? Why do we think we can be better? Because something in us already knows. You know, we're already there, and we're remembering, we're recalling. And if you think you're ever going to bring your human self up to the specs of the soul, you never will. You never will do it. The only way you can do that is ditch the body. And then you'll find that there's no need to do it. The body, as long as you have it, you're going to be a sinner. <laughs> that is, you're going to fall short of the standard of the soul. Because you're encumbered by the body. And so it's, it's just part of who we are in this body. And it's, uh, it's like being... Uh, limited to you know speed or whatever when you get in your car you're you're limited to the performance of the car it's not the fault of anybody's it's just the way it is so we're in this body we're going to have negative thoughts we're going to have negative self images we're going to have negative thoughts about other people there's all going to be all kinds of miscommunications that would not happen if the body was dropped and there was direct knowing that wouldn't happen so the resurrection principle is at work now. The old way of thinking of yourself is passing right now. And the new light of life, new light and life of your soul is shining forth. Hold this vision for yourself. That's really the Easter message, I think, is in a nutshell. Is you're okay as you are. And if we hold that thought, hold that idea, it helps bring more of that to the surface of our experience. Okay? Pretty easy? <laughs> okay. All right. Well, happy Easter. Thank you for watching this week's program. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with others. We want to reach as many people as we can, and we appreciate your help. If you'd like to help support this ministry, just click the donate card at the top right hand corner of your screen. 
Your financial support means a lot to us. We have many subjects in our video lineup, so feel free to take a look. If there's a topic you don't see and would like me to address, just put it in the comment section. I'd love to know what's on your mind. To subscribe to this channel, simply click our logo. Thanks again for your interest in Independent Unity, and have a wonderful week.